Good afternoon again to everyone, both those who are here locally as well as those who are overseas as well, those who are listening via cyberspace or the internet. God has granted us a measure of understanding thus far as we looked at the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation, which we have already shown will those who study it, that is, will give them an entirely different religious experience. It will bring about a revival, even, and a reformation among God's people. And this afternoon is no different as we look at another segment of this Battle of Armageddon entitled The Kings of the East. And if we have time, we will look at the Kings of the East in relation to the the not just the drying up the river Euphrates, but also the slaughter of Ezekiel 9. I pray that as the Spirit of God leads, guides, and directs upon whom we heavily depend, that that Spirit will be the teacher of truth, also to convict us of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment as we look at these kings of the East, who they are, and the work which they have to do. Join me in prayer as we ascend to the throne of grace in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. Let us pray. Our gracious God and Father, thank you for being with us even in this session. Please take control as you seek to make it clear to our minds the kings of the east of the sun rising and the great work that you have for them to do. We pray that you may grant us a vision and an understanding so that we shall be guided by that spirit into all truth. We thank you for being with us even now in this session. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Just a brief recap as we continue to look at the subject of the Battle of Armageddon, especially focusing today on the kings of the East. There are so many understandings that people have but we are following the biblical understanding and interpretation using the biblical Old Testament parallels, type, anti-type, so that we cannot go around as we look at these important segments. First of all, we saw that the Battle of Armageddon takes place under the sixth plague. After the closure of human probation, everybody's mind made up, the plagues begin to fall. And then it's at the sixth plague that we have the drying up of the river Euphrates that paves the way for the kings of the east, the Bible says. That's Revelation chapter 16 and verses 13 and 14. But we have said a lot in terms of parallelism, and we used last time the parallel of the story of the fall of ancient Babylon in the days of Cyrus, and then showed a spiritual connection parallel, as it were, to the spiritual Babylon and how it will fall. First of all, in the literal local story of ancient Babylon that fell in the days of Cyrus, we have a literal Cyrus right there on the screen with you, just a quick recap. We have a literal Cyrus who was called anointed in the Bible. And as a matter of fact, uh, that literal Cyrus was also called in Isaiah 40, the righteous man from the east. A literal Babylon that was built on a literal Euphrates or waters of Babylon. Then there was a literal drying up in, in that Cyrus diverted the waters of the river so that his soldiers could go over the river, cross the river, and enter into the through the two leave gates which were left open in the city of Babylon that great night of Belshazzar's peace. A literal drying up with a literal army from the east that came to deliver a literal Israel that were in Babylonian captivity and then occurred a literal destruction of the, her literal enemies, as it were. But the Bible shows there's a spiritual counterpart in the end time. There's a spiritual Cyrus, Jesus Christ, who was also called the anointed Messiah, spiritual Babylon that was built on the river Euphrates or waters, and this, there was a spiritual drying up, withdrawing their support from spiritual Babylon. 
and also a spiritual army of kings from the east who come to deliver spiritual Israel from their captivity, they're from their spiritual Babylonian enemies. And then occurs the literal destruction of their spiritual enemies. So the Bible has given us many counterparts, as it were, to show us that many parallels as well, to show us that what we are talking about when it comes to these kings of the East. I will prove today that these kings of the East, while they have their source in heaven, the armies of heaven, they also have their counterpart on God's armies on earth. We will prove that clearly as well. All right, and that is where we go from there. Now, the kings of the East in Revelation chapter 16 are pitted against the kings of the earth and of the whole world. We're going to prove that. Revelation chapter 16. Read the book of Revelation, the 16th chapter. And we have to let scripture interpret scripture. And we can't go wrong when we do that. Scripture interpreting scripture. Revelation chapter 16. And I read from verse 13. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophets. The Bible says, For there are the spirits of devils working miracles. Interesting. Which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. So it is clear that even though this is mentioned under the sixth plague here, the gathering itself must be done prior to that because there are two phases to this battle of Armageddon. Very important. Two phases. We will come to that. The establishment of the mark of the beast system, which makes war against God's true people, passing religious laws and seeking to, that they may not be able to buy nor sell, and then making a decree that they should be killed. But it is in the armies of God, during the outpouring of the seven last plagues upon the wicked, that God's people will get the victory. Very important. Now, the Bible says, gather them together to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. But then verse 16 we saw, and he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. We have already proven what this is, a position that Satan will bring his people to onto the mountain of slaughter. A mountain of cutting up, mountain of destruction, as it were. That is correct rendition, as it were, of the Greek. Now, so in the end time, you have spiritual Babylon gathered together by Satan. And that, that is the armies of Satan. And who are they composed of? The kings of the earth and of the whole world. And they are gathered against who at that time? Against the people of God on earth. They are fighting against the people of God on earth. Christ in the person of his, final, his armies on earth. And why do we say that those people of God are referred to as army? Well, the Bible teaches in, a numerous, in numerous places that the people of God are an army. Not only are they called army in, in Solomon Kings, Songs of Solomon, sorry, when the Bible says, Fair as the sun, clear as the moon, and terrible as an army with banners, God's church goes forth, conquering and to conquer. But the Bible says that we are to put on the whole armor of God, that we may be able to fight against the wiles of the devil. It's a war. And we have to put on the breastplate of righteousness. We have to have the shield of the, the, the spirit, the shield of faith, and we are also to 
have the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Interesting indeed, the Bible teaches us. So the people of God are to be well armored because they have a battle to fight. And there's a virtual counterpart to that battle of Armageddon. But ultimately in the end, it will be made manifest literally. There will be a literal slaughter in the battle of Armageddon to terminate the battle of Armageddon as it were. So we go from there. The kings of the east, Revelation 16, are pitted against the kings of the earth and of the whole world gathered by Satan, by his threefold union of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet, following scripture, as it were. But at the time when they are about to destroy God's people, we are told that God will intervene to deliver them. In the hour of utmost extremity, that will be the hour of God's opportunity. It will be at midnight that God will choose to deliver his people. When God turns the captivity, it will be at midnight. God will turn the captivity of his people and give them the victory like how he did Jehoshaphat and his army in 2 Chronicles 20, especially from verse 22 through verse 25. You're going to come to that at this moment. But God will give them a signal victory of deliverance, as it were. It will be at midnight. That God will choose to deliver his people. Just when Satan was, is about to pounce upon them and wipe them off the face of the earth, God will intervene. And there are passages of scripture that deals with God delivering. At that time shall Michael stand up. You remember that text? Daniel chapter 12 verse 1. The great prince that standeth for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, everyone whose name is written in the book. Very important passage of scripture. So, in scripture, we have the Old Testament type of Jehoshaphat's army coming to fight against three armies. Interesting indeed. Again, three unclean spirits like frogs coming from the mouth of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. And they are coming to fight against the armies of God. In this case of Jehoshaphat, let's turn there now to 2 Chronicles chapter 20. I'm going to read it. I'm going to highlight certain verses for you. 2 Chronicles chapter 20. Listen to it from verses 1 and then verse 2. It says, In it came to pass after this also that the children of Ammon and the children of the children of Moab and the children of Ammon and with them others besides the Ammonites came against Jehoshaphat to battle. Interesting. And then the Bible says it is the three verse 10 and now behold the children of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir, whom thou wouldest not let Israel invade when they came out of the land of Egypt, but they turned from them and destroyed them not. Interesting. Three groups came to fight against Jehoshaphat and his armies. But listen to what happens in the end. The Bible says, we have it there. God told Jehoshaphat the strategy to use. What was that? What was that strategy that God told them to use? Look at it. We have it there on the screen for you. God told Jehoshaphat to gather an, a choir and let the choir go before him singing. Interesting. God's methods compared to man's method. When the choir was sent out to the battle singing, it confused the enemy. They thought that Jehoshaphat's army had a reinforcement or backup. The moment you come in to fight against someone, they come out singing. What is that going to do to your mind? What will you think? What will you be thinking? The Lord set ambushments among the enemy camp, and they saw each other as an enemy, turned their swords against each other, and they killed each other. Now let's read it. Second Chronicles chapter 20, verse 
22. Listen to this carefully. And when they began to sing and to praise the Lord, sorry, when they began to sing and praise, interesting, the Lord set ambushments. Interesting, the Lord set ambushments against the children of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, which were come against Judah, and they were smitten. For the children, watch the mechanism, watch what happened. For the children of Ammon and Moab stood up against the inhabitants of Mount Seir, utterly to slay and destroy them. And when they had made an end of the, inhab of the inhabitants of Seir, everyone helped to destroy another. You see what happened there? That is a type of what will happen in the final battle of Armageddon. And that is explained in Revelation 17 from verse 14 right to the end. A beautiful parallel. Verse 24 says, And when Judah came toward the watchtower in the wilderness, they looked unto the multitude, and behold, they were dead bodies fallen to the earth, and none escaped. Verse 25, And when Jehoshaphat and his people came to take away the spoils of them, they found among them in abundance both riches with the dead bodies and precious jewels, which they stripped off for themselves more than they could carry away. And there were three days in gathering of the spoil. It was so much. That victory came as a result of Jehoshaphat's prayer. Notice Jehoshaphat's prayer, even though we're not dealing with prayer. Jehoshaphat's recounted God leading in the path. And then he says, these armies have come to fight against us. And we didn't fight against them. When we were passing through smiting. But now they have come to get, come against us. But he says, But our eyes are upon thee. Praise the Lord. Notice where their eyes were. Our eyes are upon thee. And then he says, We trust you to fight this battle for us. And that is when God communicated to Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat just what he should do to gain the victory. So notice that battle. That battle is a type of the final battle, we call it the Battle of Armageddon. So we have another example in the case of Gideon. This is clearly illustrated, this, this same scenario in the story of Gideon and the Midianites and their signal victory. Gideon, again, and his army were a type of the end time church or saints of God. Spiritual Jews or spiritual Israelites. Remember that terminology. And we have proven that last week as well. Now God told Gideon to tell all those who would like to come out to fight against the Midianite to voluntarily come out, make a decision. When that call came out, 32,000 came out to fight, to join Gideon's army against the Midianites of 145,000 Midianites. God told Gideon, that army that you have, that have come out are too large. I cannot win the battle with them. Ask those who want to go back home to do so. Quickly, 22,000 left and went back home. That's interesting. In many churches, circles today, people come out because of convenience. Because it involves a battle or a fight or because they hear of the largeness of an army. And that left 10,000. God again appeared to Gideon and said, Gideon, this army that you have of 10,000 is too many, too much. I cannot win by them and get the victory and the glory. Tell all those who, uh, identify all those who lack the water with their hands and did not bow their knees to select them. And sure enough, when they were selected and the crowd was lessened, it came down to 300, a 300 strong army. God said to Gideon, now you have enough. This is a group that were called. They were then chosen. And then there was a down to a faithful 300 strong army. And God even gave them the mechanism 
by which to get the victory. God told Gideon, get his strong army of 300 and let them carry lamps and cover the lamps with the pitchers, that is jugs. Breaking the pitchers and allowing the lamps to shine forth at the top of the hills, at the shout, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. And it was at midnight that Gideon gathered his strong army band, circled the Midianites of 300 with the 300 strong army with lamps and pitchers. Lamps meaning their light shining and pitchers, the covering of that light. And when they shouted the sword of the Lord and of Gideon and they broke the pitchers, that threw the army into a suspense as it were. And they were totally confused among them. Now that lamp represents the Christian lifestyle that presently is being sheltered or covered by this sinful fallen flesh. But when the righteousness of Christ takes hold of the lives of God's people, they will not just get the victory over the flesh, the world and the devil, those will be broken, but the light of Jesus Christ and his righteousness will shine forth through them at that time. The sword of the Lord and of Gideon is what they shouted. So hearing the shout and seeing the lights and the noise, it totally disarmed, it totally confused even the Midianite army. And to, to add to it, at one time Gideon told, God told Gideon to send two men down there to spy, some men down there to spy. And the men heard a conversation of one man having a dream and what he said he saw in the dream. And when they conveyed that to Gideon, that was an additional assurance that the Lord had already given the Midianites 145,000 into his hand. So the story of Gideon's army and the victory they gained was a type of the final battle of Armageddon with the victory given to the armies of God's church, God's people. I will prove that as well. Let's move a little on. So the 145,000 Midianites were routed. Each man was thought as an enemy in the darkness and they killed each other. And when Gideon reached them, they were already killed. They had already killed each other. The rest they chased and slew down by the river. Interesting again, parallel. So both the story of Jehoshaphat's army and Gideon's army showed how God got the sing signal victory over the enemy by confusing the minds of the people, setting ambushments. Neutralizing the, 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 the strength of the army, the enemy, and giving his people the victory. Now, two of those stories are types of how God will get the victory through his final remnant. Now, the Bible calls him the remnant of the woman's seed, Revelation 12, 17. The Bible calls them, in Revelation 13, that group that will not be able to bind or sell and who will not receive the mark of the beast, and a decree will be made against them that they should be killed. In Revelation 14, it is mentioned as a group that have gotten the victory. Notice the word victory, having to do a battle. Over the beast's image, mark, name, and number. In Revelation 15, they are seen standing of the sea of glass, them that had gotten the victory again. That's the 144,000 again. And Revelation 16, again, those that are, have on the garments, they are watching, they have on the garment so that the shame of their nakedness do not appear. And we can go on like that. Revelation 17, the group that give the final warning message to the world and proclaim that Babylon is fallen and when others join them, they will finally make up the 144,000. Only one group will be sealed with the seal of the living God. Not two groups, one. Some people say the 144,000 will go out and preach and bring in the great multitude. There are two groups. My friends, the Bible teaches one group that will be alive at Jesus' second coming. They are the living saints and then will occur the risen saints 
and both will join up to meet Christ in the air. Second, First Thessalonians 4 as well. So only one group will be sealed with the final apocalyptic seal, which is the 144,000. So both those who preach the loud cry, the initial loud cry servants, and those who respond to the loud cry, which will be multitudes, yes, both together, by the time probation closes, general probation, their number would have been made up. And we have proof of that as well. All right? Time of trouble, great controversy. That chapter, by the time the subject of the kingdom, the number would have been made up. That's the 144,000. A type again, so two armies so far, two armies on in the type local that reflect what will occur in the future. Now we said that this will occur, they will get their signal victory through the drying up of the river Euphrates. We said that Cyrus and his army represents the armies of God. Interest Cyrus, the anointed one, man from the east, the righteous man from the east, sorry, and the anointed, and he is the one whom God will use. That refers to Jesus Christ and his armies. Which armies? That leads me to a very critical and important question. And that question is, when is the victory given or had in the battle of Armageddon and by whom? Who gets the victory in the battle of Armageddon? When does the battle of victory actually occur? We will look at that just in a minute, my friend. The victory really occurs during the sixth and the seventh plague when spiritual Babylon is conquered and destroyed after the destruction, after the drying up of the river Euphrates, the withdrawal of supports of the people from Babylon. And then Babylon is divided into three parts in this destruction. Okay, and then follows Christ and his coming. So there are two counterparts. They are counterparts of each other. We will look at that shortly. But let's look a little more at the drying up to see what really happens in this kings of the east. Revelation 12, the same principle is brought out in, and in many other chapters as well. Revelation 12 portrays a dragon or a serpent, a serpent-like beast, spewing water out of its mouth like a flood to destroy the woman, God's church. Notice that. During the 1260-year period of papal supremacy, Revelation 12, verse 15, it also describes the earth opening up her mouth and helping the woman and swallowing up the flood, causing the waters to be dried up, setting God's people free. That's Revelation 12. And that's right in there. Then it describes the dragon, again, being wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of the woman's seed. This will be Satan's final attempt to destroy the church in the final crisis. That's Satan's final attempt. Until these people call the kings of the east. Now the purpose of the drying up is for the way to be prepared for the kings of the east. Prepared for what? What's the purpose of the drying up? That's a great question. The purpose of the drying up of the river Euphrates which is really the withdrawal of the people power and support of spiritual Babylon, is that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared, Revelation 16, 12. And I want to make two points there. One, east there refers to, the word there for east refers to sun rising. So these are kings from the sun rising. They start at a lower pace and then they move higher until they reach this Meredith, the, the central point. Kings of the east, kings of the sun rising, they can also be called. And the Bible tells us that the withdrawal of support from Babylon, mentioned in Revelation chapter 17, when the ten horns and the waters team up together with the beast and they become kings one hour with the beast and then they give their power unto the beast. And then there is a 
disintegration of the powers, a breakdown of the powers. Because someone called the Lamb and they that are with him who are called and chosen and faithful. And this Lamb is called King of Kings and Lord of Lords and they that are with him notice that who are also kings and priests unto God according to the Bible. They that are with him that are called and chosen and faithful. We see the parallel. And then the Bible says the, the power disintegrates and they actually reverse their purposes. Where they are coming to destroy God's people, they turn around now, the Bible says, and hate the whore, make her desolate and naked, burn her with fire, and that's the end of the whore. But they turn upon each other after that. Because the Bible says in Chronicles, the children of Ammon and Moab stood up against the inhabitants of Mount Slayer to slay and utterly destroy them. And when they had made an end of the inhabitants of Seir, everyone helped to destroy another. So they start to destroy one another. And that's what the Bible says in the final Armageddon. These two team up to destroy the whore and then to make her desolate, burn her with fire and so on. And then they turn upon each other and that is the end of Babylon, spiritual Babylon, or Babylon the Great. That The Bible is clear on these parallels. If we don't use the parallels, then we will end up guessing. But the parallel gives us right direction and arriving at the right conclusion. All right. So what was the purpose of the drying up? The withdrawal of the support from the people and the support from spiritual Babylon that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. Now in the Bible you remember that John the Baptist paved the way for the first coming of Jesus. Jesus Christ. The final spiritual Elijah, that's the 144,000, they will pave and prepare the way for the second coming of Jesus Christ. And when Jesus Christ comes, he is coming with his, his own glory, his father's glory, and all the glory of the angels. But they are coming after God's people on earth, God's army on earth, has gotten the victory. Very important. And it is at Christ's second coming that the Bible says the sword that proceeded out of his mouth and the brightness of his coming will slay the remainder of the wicked. It will be the result of the revelation that will be given from the mouths of God's people. The final 144,000. And there are passages in the scripture that actually prove that. God calls his people to be a battle axe and to destroy the enemy through righteousness. But Revelation 19 also tells us, Revelation 19 also tells us, that it will be the war will be executed in righteousness okay I would have given you some parallels there on the screen just as Cyrus the righteous man from the east the anointed dried up the literal river Euphrates by diverting its channel of court prepared the way for his armies to conquer Babylon so Christ this antitype of Cyrus the righteous one from the east the son, son of righteousness notice what Jesus Christ is called the son of righteousness. The anointed will through the final church prepare the way for the conquering of spiritual Babylon. Very, very significant indeed. All right. The armies of heaven, the Bible shows, Christ and his holy angels have their counterpart. It's very important to understand this. They have their counterpart in the 144,000 spiritual Israelite army on earth. Overcomers here on earth who get the victory over the beast or spiritual Babylon. Very significant. Tight, anti-tight. Counterparts. For example, there was an earthly sanctuary and it had its counterpart in the heavenly sanctuary. Whatever occurred in the heavenly sanctuary 
was a reflection of what happened in the earthly sanctuary. Christ ministering as our high priest in the sanctuary above, while the earth, earthly priest ministered in the sanctuary on earth. There was a work Christ was doing on behalf of his people. And the counterpart of the cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary is on the sanctuary on earth, which is the cleansing of the hearts of God's people. The heavenly sanctuary is but the monitor. The earthly sanctuary is the keyboard. When we come to the blood note of sins, we will see some of that. Whatever happens on the, in the earthly sanctuary, which represents God's true people and, his clean, and their cleansing, have its counterpart in the cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary. Both are reflected. Whatever is typed in in the keyboard reflects itself. It is seen in the monitor. So the heavenly sanctuary is like the monitor, and the earthly sanctuary, the people of God on earth, which is God's true sanctuary now, a tabernacle not made with hands, in the hearts of men and women, is reflected the work that Christ is doing in the sanctuary above. That's what we mean by a counterpart. So while there's the armies of heaven, Christ of the holy angels coming, we have a counterpart of his army on earth doing a work, fighting a battle, and getting a victory in this final war. Spiritual Israelites are overcomers here on earth who get the victory over the beast. So there's that dual application. It is that group of people that paved the way for the second coming of Jesus. But where are these people? Even though they are on earth, the Bible shows, Colossians chapter 3 verse 1, set your affections where? On things above, not on things on the earth. Very important. So their minds are set on things above. They are sitting with Christ in heavenly places. They have the victory, as it were, in Jesus Christ. And God is waiting for the time to reproduce that victory in and through Christ, through them. Christ will get the victory over the beast and his image through them. How do we know that? Daniel chapter 7 is a little clear on it. The purpose of the judgment is to give the dominion and the kingdom and all of that into the hands of the saints. Interesting again. Into the hands of the saints. And then the little horn is conquered as a result of the work of the judgment. Interesting again. So the cleansing of the sanctuary has its counterpart to the cleansing of the hearts of God's people on earth which has to do with getting the victory eventually over the little horn. And that is found in Daniel chapter 7 as well. The final victory is given and the kingdom and the dominion is given to the people of the saints of the Most High. That's God's final remnant. Daniel chapter 7 also approves that. So we can't go around there. So their minds and their affections are set on things above. They are sitting with Christ in heavenly places. And they are following the Lamb on earth, whithersoever he is going. So when they follow him on earth, they will follow him above as well. So if you are a saint on earth, you are a saint, you will become a saint in heaven. So there's a counterpart. So it's not just the battle being fought in heaven. There's a battle that is being fought on earth. Christ, through his final remnant, the 144 times. That's what the Bible says, Revelation, uh, Revelation 12, 17. And the dragon was wroth with the woman, that's God's church on earth, and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God. So the devil is the devil is warned against Christ in the person of his saints, his final seed. And if he can get the victory over them, he will win the battle if he can get the victory. But the Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says the Lamb overcame them. And the righteous ones, Revelation 12, 11, and they overcame him, the dragon, by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And next week we want to look at this battle between the dragon and the Lamb. A very interesting battle. The dragon and the Lamb, which is the uh, phase of Armageddon as well. So the Bible is clear. 
So we can't go wrong. The Christ is the antitype to Cyrus. He is the one who dries up the river Euphrates. And that is through the work of the 144,000 preaching and revealing God's character so clearly that it will lead the wicked to become confused and see that they have been deceived or deluded and the weapons which they had to destroy God's people, they will now turn against their common enemies that were with them. They didn't even know they were enemies. When the Lord works to deliver his people, there will be an awakening. Eyes will be open. People will see that they have been deluded and betrayed. We'll come to that in the battle, in the slaughter of Ezekiel 9. In the meantime, let's just finish off this section. Very important. It is the armies on earth which will win with Christ through that army, the 144,000, that will get the victory which will pave the way for Christ's second coming. Remember, it is only when they are ripe in righteousness will they cry to Christ who is sitting on the cloud. What will they say to him? Trust in thy sickle and reap. Revelation 14, 15, and 16. For the time is come for you to reap. For the harvest of the earth is ripe. Revelation 14, verses 14, 15, and 16. And only then will Christ put in his second appearance and harvest his people from the earth. It's important to understand that, that principle. We call it the harvest principle. When, the question is again, when does the armies of God, because the church is called the army of God as well, and they ask to put on the whole armor of God. When does the armies of God get the victory for God over the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet? When the spiritual Babylon, when is spiritual Babylon conquered and destroyed? The answer is at the sixth and the seventh plague in the outpouring of the seven last plague in the slaughter of Ezekiel 9. That's right there down by the sixth and the seventh plague. That's where the slaughter of Ezekiel 9 will take place. Not before the loud cry, not before probation closes, but all the way down by the sixth and the seventh plague. That is where the final slaughter of Ezekiel 9 will take place. More on that later. So the final armies of God are called kings from the sun rising. The Bible calls them kings and priests unto God. And they are the order of Melchizedek. That's interesting too. Because the order of Melchizedek was made up of king, king, king priests, as it were. Kings and priests unto God. And that's why the Bible calls them a royal priesthood. How does the Bible call them? First Peter 2. A royal priesthood. The kings and priests, a holy nation, a chosen people, that they should shine forth the light of God in the darkness. Very important. Very, very important. So the final, our final armies of God are called kings from the sun rising because they receive the seal of the living God from the sealing angel from the east. Now we come to something very significant indeed. In this way, the withdrawal of human support from mystical Babylon is seen as the removal of the last barrier to her ultimate defeat, punishment, and destruction. That last barrier, the withdrawal of the human support from mystical Babylon. It is the revelation from the spirit of his mouth and the brightness of his coming, which is his glory, the revelation of his character, that will consume them as they run to the rocks and the mountains and ask the rocks and the mountains to fall on them and to hide them from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath is come. Revelation chapter 6, verses 15 and 16, and also Revelation 12, verse 11. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. So the kings of the east in, east in Revelation 16, 12 are the kings, father and son of heaven. And we have to understand that. Jesus is king of kings, king of kings, and lord of lords. Very important. And they are called the kings of the east 
because that is the direction from which heavenly beings approach the earth from the east. For example, look, let's look at the example. The, right, right there written for you, Jesus coming, second coming will be from the east. Matthew chapter 24 verse 27 says, For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Matthew chapter 24 and verse 27. Not only that, right on the screen there for you again, God's glory comes from the east. Ezekiel 43 verse 2 says, And behold, the glory of the Lord, the God of Israel, came from the way of the east. That's the sun rising. Revelation seeing an angel comes from the east. Revelation 7 verse 2. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, the Greek word for sun rising, having the seal of the living God. And when he sees the people of God with the seal from the sun rising, they are sealed 144,000. The number that is heard seal is the 144,000. Interesting. The sun symbolizing Jesus rises in the east. Malachi 4 verse 2. But unto you that fear my name shall the son of righteousness arise with healing in his wings. The people of God are called priests and kings. And they are the ones who paved the way, getting the victory over the beast. His image, mark, name, and number. Over the beast, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. They are the ones who will be kings and priests unto God. They will pave the way for Jesus Christ and his other armies coming for his people. He will come for his people. And all of that is clear in the Bible. So, kings from the sun rising, as it were. Now, what we didn't show is that there's the parallels in Revelation chapter 12 are also parallel. They are also committed to the parallel in Revelation 13. For example, in Revelation 13, the beast ruled for 42 months, made war with the saints, then received a deadly wound after the 1260 year period. This is the same time period. And the same thing at the drying up of the waters in Revelation 12. The earth helped the woman by swallowing the waters which were spewed out of the woman's mouth. The parallel is also Revelation chapter 14. In Revelation 14, 15 to 19, the seventh angel cries to the sixth angel to trust in his sharp sickle and reap. We'll see more about that in the Ezekiel 9 slaughter. And when the angel trusts in his sickle, the harvest of the wicked after the close of human probation will occur, during the outpouring of the plagues, the blood is poured out. You notice the blood is poured out in the treading of the clusters of the vines of the earth onto the horse bridle. This is the description of the wicked during the plagues and its outpouring. And then there's a parallel, Revelation 16. These passages are parallel. The next time the waters will flow again, is mentioned in the pouring out of the sixth plague after the close of human probation. This is the next or final breaking forth or rushing of the waters of Euphrates. That's what the word means, rushing or breaking forth against the people of God. What were the waters of Euphrates going to do before they are dried up? To drown the people of God during that period. And what will prevent them from drowning the people of God? The righteous man from the east through the revelation of his people, will cause them to withdraw their support from Babylon. And in Revelation 17, next parallel, in Revelation we have already seen that the waters and the ten horns will hit the whore and make her desolate and burn her with fire. Remember what the Spirit of Prophecy said? Bible Commentary, Volume 7, 983, Paragraph 3. In the 17th of Revelation, is foretold the destruction of all the churches who corrupt themselves by idolatrous devotion to the service of the papacy. Those who have made drunk of those who have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. That destruction occurs between the sixth and the seventh 
play. Just before Jesus burst the clouds of heaven with his other armies to join the ones on earth through whom Christ gets the victory. And that's a parallel to the Revelation 18 as well. Revelation 18, 4 to 21 describes the destruction of Babylon and her utter end. All of these are the judgments that come upon Babylon in the day of visitation of God's wrath. She has filled up the measure of iniquity. Her time it has come. She is ripe for destruction. And that occurs at the six, between the sixth and the seventh plagues after the closure of human probation. And of course, that too is parallel to Revelation 19, verses 4 to 15. As a matter of fact, you can read 14 to 15, 19, 20, and 21. The beasts and the kings of the earth and their armies. You heard that? The beasts and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war with him that sat on the horse. That's Jesus Christ. And his army, the Bible says, for in righteousness he doth judge and make war. God makes war in righteousness. No force involved. No compulsion whatsoever. God, God uses only the principles of love, truth, and righteousness in warring against the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. No force, no destruction by God physically, literally. It is the wicked that ultimately destroy themselves in that final slaughter of Ezekiel 9 in the battle of Armageddon. Very, very interesting. Both were cast alive, the Bible says in Revelation 19, into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone, and the remnant were slain with the sword of him who sat on the horse. Very interesting indeed. Parallels to the Revelation and to Gideon's army as well. The next time we will hopefully, and um, there's a lot more we can look at. We're looking at one last, one last, um, <clears throat> few thoughts. Another parallel in Daniel 11, 44 and 45, right through to Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. We will come back to the slaughter of Ezekiel 9 first, and hopefully we can tie in that with that battle between the dragon and the lamb. Very important. Now in Daniel chapter 11, verses 44 and 45, after conquering all the others that came before and overturning them with a flood, the Bible says, there's a specific group that will escape. Very significant. But the Bible says, something called tidings out of the east and out of the north will trouble the king of the north, the final papacy. Very significant indeed. Tidings, which is good news, out of the east, the sun rising, and out of the north, why east and north? Because the Bible says Zion is located in the sides of the north, yet it is in the east, the north and the east, that Satan wanted to overthrow God's government. Then Satan said, I will sit upon the mount of the congregation in the side of the north. That was his attempt to take over the government of God based on his principles of operating. But in this case, there is something called a good news or tidings out of the east and out of the north, which is God's headquarters, that will trouble him. And that is parallel to the final warning message and the loud cry that will be given, that will trouble spiritual Babylon. The papacy goes forth, Revelation, again, Daniel 11, 45, 44 and 45, the papacy goes forth with fury to destroy and utterly to make away many, that is, put an, put an end to God's people. Same parallel to Revelation 17 and all the others. Satan, through the final papacy, a union of church and state, Using its power to destroy people, God's people. Satan, through the papacy, spiritual and time Babylon, as his final agent, shall plant the tabernacles of his palace. 
You see that term, tabernacles of his palace? Similar to Mount of the Congregation. Very important. He tries to set up his kingdom between the seas, the masses of the people, Euphrates. Here we come in again to parallel. He tries to set up his kingdom between the seas, the masses of the people, Euphrates, which he's dependent on, and not in, and the glorious holy mountain, God's people. Right between the Euphrates and God's holy glorious mountain. Yet, the Bible says, he shall come to his end and none shall help him. And at that time, shall Michael stand up to deliver God's people. Who will be Michael in the last days? Who will this Michael be that will stand up to deliver God's people? Now, Michael standing up meant the closure of human probation. Because when Michael stand up, human probation is closed. When Stephen saw Jesus stand up, it was the closure of probation for the Jewish nation. But at that time shall Michael stand up. Who is that? Michael. The Bible says that he is called the Archangel. The Bible also calls him the mighty Archangel. The, ar the, the voice of the Archangel is what will resurrect all the righteous dead. Yet the Bible says it will be the voice of the Son of God that will raise his people from the dead. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. The Lord himself, that's Jesus. There's a shout with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise for earth. Who will that Michael be at the end time? The archangel that will stand up to deliver God's people at the closure of probation when the plagues will come upon the wicked but not upon those who have received the seal of the living God. Those are the final end time reformers. Those who love God with all their heart. Those who dress like reformers. Those who live like reformers. Those who eat like reformers. And those who live like reformers. They represent God's true people. So anytime a people pretend to be among reformation. And do not exhibit the traits of true reformers. Or represent true reformation. They are not among God's final reformation. They will not be among God's final reformatory church. May the Lord bless us as we allow his spirit to continue to teach us and to guide us into all truth. Let us pray. Gracious God and Father, bless your word to our heart. Continue to open up the eyes of our understanding and give us guidance by your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. May God richly bless you as you continue to look at these parallels. And like us and subscribe to us as well. It's my prayer for all of us in Jesus' name.